was my life I would tell you Show love, show you right What else can I do? I'm so inspired by you And I'm just holding for the longest time Once I knew my stocks and bonds were gone I knew Toshinaka Mono was the one Welcome back to Hard Money. So excited that joining me this week is bond and credit expert Greg Foss. Greg, so good to see you. How are you? I'm doing well, Nat. Thanks for having me. Looking forward to uh, being on your new show. Yeah, first time on Hard Money. By the way, what's your four-letter word of the week? Oh, put me on the spot. My four-letter word of the week has to be fiat. I'm not going to swear on your show, so my four-letter word of the week is fiat. And why is that? Boy, are we in trouble. You've seen some crazy announcement out of the Bank of Japan today, for example. Uh, it reminds me of my time in uh, the great financial crisis when every single day you had some sort of talking head from the finance uh, circles, whether it was the head of Lehman or the head of Bear Stearns. Oh, don't worry. Everything is just fine. Nothing to see here. Um, as soon as the talking heads start saying stuff like that, you know that there's uh, you know, there's some uh, approaching flames and uh, yeah, a little bit nervous, to be honest. Yeah, there's something brewing under the surface. Well, I'm going to get to questions about Japan. But first, Greg, you tweeted this week about credit default swaps, CDS, and you talked about the value of Bitcoin. Can you walk us through that math, especially for those maybe not familiar with just how the credit default swap market works? I'll be very clear that this is not uh, grade 11 math uh, from the perspective of sitting in a risk chair, okay? Trading credit default swaps is a very specific business. It's confined to the largest funds in the world. You need what's called an ISDA, an International Swaps Dealers Association accreditation. Uh, it's done between hedge funds and banks and uh, banks and large asset managers. It's not for the little guy, but I use the CDS markets, the credit default swap markets on sovereign debt to provide a valuation matrix for Bitcoin. Uh, it's done through a credit lens, not because that's where my experience has been. I spent my entire career in credit markets, as you know. So I always start an analysis with a credit perspective. So really quickly, and I did send out a tweet. I like to think of Bitcoin as a essentially a credit default swap on a basket of fiat currencies. And that is to say that you are buying insurance on the potential default of some of the currencies in that basket. Now, as we know, uh, there have been uh, regular defaults that have happened within uh, particularly emerging market economies. For example, I've said that in my career, Argentina has defaulted four times. Well, Argentina is a G20 country. I have yet to experience the formal default of a G7 country, but I believe that is probably coming as well. Anyway, to line up how I value Bitcoin as a, an insurance policy on these baskets of currencies, look at the current five-year default swap rate on USA, and that's 20 basis points, which means that it costs you $20,000 a year to insure $10 million of debt on the USA against default. Now, many people say, why in the world would you buy protection on the USA if they can just print money and solve a default by printing more money? And the truth is, that is an excuse. Nonetheless, people still do it. I'm not going to argue with the market. The market is 20 basis points, which means people are paying that premium. Why are they paying that premium? Because they obviously think there's a greater than zero chance the USA can default. 
if you look through the list of uh, tradable sovereign credits, you'll notice that some of them like Italy are much higher than 20 basis points. And some of them like Turkey are substantially higher than 20 basis points because people would not argue that the probability of defaults of those countries are higher than the USA. But I just looked at the USA and it's 20 basis points. And I adjust it from a five-year tenor to a 20-year tenor. So four basis points a year means that over 20 years, for a period of 20 years, I estimate that the USA would be worth 80 basis points. If anyone was to sell insurance, they would get 80 basis points on that contract. And then I just take the outstanding debt of the United States, which is 30 trillion of funded debt and another 170 trillion I actually made an error if someone pointed it out in my calculation. I used 160 trillion. It's actually now up to 170 trillion. So in total, Nat, there's 170 trillion plus 30 trillion, 200 trillion of USA obligations out there. And I just multiply 80 basis points by that, 200 trillion, and you come up with $1.6 trillion is essentially how much default protection would be worth on the entire USA. Now, funny thing is Bitcoin only trades for 375 billion. So if my thesis was correct, and I'm not saying it is, it's just the way I like to look at it. You're getting default protection on the USA for less than one third of the value and you're getting all the other nations in the world for free. And I think a lot of people would agree with me that the chances of other nations defaulting before the USA is substantially higher. So I like to get stuff for free and only pay one third the price for the USA. It was my way of saying, my God, Bitcoin is undervalued. That's right. It's just math, as you always say. Well, let's talk about another country, Japan. That's something you've been focusing on. Greg, can you provide an update on what's going on with the bond market there? Maybe we'll start with that. Well, yeah, it's hard to say what's happening with the bond market because it's so manipulated. The yield curve control, the desire to keep the 10-year rate at 25 basis points has hit uh, some bumps, but it's all guns blazing. The bigger concern that I had was when the Bank of Japan, one of the governors came out today, I can't remember who it was, and basically said, it's all fine, as I mentioned earlier. Well, chances are it's not all fine. And why is that? Because Yellen, very quickly thereafter, went on tape saying, oh, the USA and Japan are going to, ex- are going to explore all ways of controlling the yen and keeping things uh, stable, if you will. Uh, That's just another way of doing quantitative easing that Bernanke said many years ago that the way the USA could invoke quantitative easing is by participating in foreign countries' debt markets. Well, it looks to me like they are potentially going to invoke quantitative easing in Japan as some backdoor methodology of uh, employing QE across the world, just not in the USA's debt markets. And here's the funny thing, Preston Pish jumped on this immediately, and he basically sent out, oh, okay, so that's what the, U- what the U- U.S. taxpayer money is going to be used for. Is it to support the bond market in Japan at manipulated below market rates? So what a bit of a, you know, a bit of a circular logic, a bit of a, a cesspool of uh, old banker thinking, but yeah, it's not pretty. And I know you mentioned Japan implementing yield curve controls. Can you just explain for the audience what that really means? And could we see that here in the U.S.? Absolutely. Uh, uh, an economist that I'm very fond of, Luke Groman, uh, believes that yield curve control is the only way we can escape uh, the debt spiral in the USA. What yield curve control is, is basically the central bank pegging a rate somewhere along the yield curve. Let's take Japan's case where it's at a rate of 25 basis points, they basically say they will buy all the bonds that are for sale at 25 basis points. There's a price at which they will put a stake in the ground that anybody in the world, including hedge funds that are shorting the debt to them, they will buy all that debt at 25 basis points. And it's a way of pegging a point in their yield curve to try and 
control the shape of the overall yield curve, but most importantly, to keep the base level of interest rates locked at 25 basis points. Luke Roman thinks that that's the only way the USA escapes the current debt spiral by employing yield curve control in the USA and allowing inflation to actually run hot so that your GDP, your tax base grows at the rate of inflation, but your yield curve and your nominal rate on your yield curve is below the rate of inflation. It's basically the IMF financial repression methodology of reducing the debt spiral. It's not good for bondholders. It's horrible for the currency. It's the reason that you need hard money, hence the name of your show. It's the reason you need Bitcoin. Well, I wanted to ask you, a lot of people are reacting to this bear market and it feels like people are waiting for the Fed to pivot. The Fed's not really ready to pivot. They're trying to tackle inflation. What is it going to take to see Bitcoin go up again? It will be some sort of event that uh, comes out of left field. Uh, something like Russia pricing oil and natural gas in Bitcoin. Something like a central bank of a large country uh, divulging that they've accumulated a certain amount of Bitcoin and plan to accumulate more of it. Or perhaps it's nothing more than education where people realize that every single asset in the world is being debased because of the Fed policy. Let's get on board an asset that is programmed to increase in value, whose monetary supply is written in math and code. So education's the long run. The short run would be something like a, uh, uh, you know, an, an announcement. And then the real one will be, uh, or a, a very potential one is when the Fed pivots. The Fed pivot will increase values of, uh, or, or stop the bleeding in a lot of risk assets. And unfortunately, Bitcoin is still traded as a risk asset, even though, as you know, I think it should be traded as insurance. I'm not bigger than the market. You got to watch what the market's doing, not what you believe. So lots of ways it could happen. But unfortunately, there's lots of ways it could still, uh, you know, experience some down, uh, down drafts, no question. Well, I know you don't have a crystal ball, but just given the macro environment right now, what will spark the Fed to pivot? What do you think is going to break down in the system, knowing everything that's happening from Europe to Japan and beyond? Look, Japan, I mean, there's all sorts of things that could happen. You already have some Fed governors that are talking back the, the you know, assumed 75 basis point uh, increase that's coming in the next two weeks. Uh, there's Fed governors are smart enough to read financial markets. Uh, you know, today's close on the equity markets was pathetic. Financial stocks took a huge gap lower at the end of the day. Uh, business confidence is at all time lows, literally all time lows. This is not good for the economy. And the USA is going to have to choose whether it wants full employment or control inflation but it's not going to be able to do both, okay? The likely pivot comes, in my opinion, where they change their inflation target, where they move it from 2% to something like 4%. Then they declare victory and say, okay, so now we have 4% inflation targets, so now we can afford to uh, you know, stop the tightening cycle. It's, it, you know, it's, it's always that, Matt. It's always smoke and mirrors with the Fed. Uh, they talk a big game and then they pivot because the markets and the U.S. dollar global wrecking ball is destroying emerging markets right now. Historic losses in emerging markets. Well, when you have historic losses in, of capital in emerging markets, those are your trading partners. Those cause glo global uh, GDP to decrease. A global depression is in the offing. And I think the Fed will pivot. I'm not certain of it because I think that Jerome Powell is not the right man for that chair. He's a lawyer. He is not a risk manager. Yeah, well, and we're seeing these crises playing out. There are so many dramatic videos from across the world coming in that almost make it seem like the global system is on the brink of implosion. But, you know, to wrap it up with you, Greg, I know we don't have too much uh, more time with you, but tell us what's one thing that central bankers are doing right right now and the biggest thing they're getting wrong. I honestly cannot think of anything they're doing right, okay? Like, I think they are absolutely 
uh, very juniors in the room. Uh, they are not listening to the markets. They are using backward looking data, okay? Employment reports are backward looking. They're not looking to financial conditions. They're not looking at credit spreads. They're not looking at the, the, uh, the uh, jamming up of financial markets. You know, this is a situation where you have a guy that's trying to be like the old Paul Volcker, okay, the uh, Fed chairman in 1982 that arrested uh, inflation in 1982. The difference is that the debt situation in the world is about three times larger than it was when Volcker uh, used the same uh, tactics. It doesn't work with a global debt spiral that we're in, That We've talked about this. Someone asked that question. Total global debt to GDP is 400%. It doesn't work, okay? There is a limit that you can increase interest rates before the whole system explodes. It's like the, the, the central bankers haven't even done the math. It's very concerning. So I'm afraid I can't think of anything they're doing correctly. If they laid out that, they've done, that they've actually done the math, then I'd have more confidence in it. I don't believe they've actually done the math. Well, that's a fair response. And it all goes back to the big problem, your four letter word, fiat, right? So thank you so much, Greg, for joining us. It was my pleasure. Thanks for having me. And this is a great show. So I look forward to, uh, to coming on in, in, in the future if you'll have me. No longer have to trust these banks to not debase our currency satoshi took that power away from these people bitcoin is changing the world and all you have to do is take your bitcoin into self-custody ship post with your friends and spread the sound money gospel to everyone that will listen because this is all we have to do guys we just have to show people that the bitcoin network is here and they have the tools provide the value to your fellow man provide your services for bitcoin and just make sure your meat sack makes it over the finish line guys stay humble stack sats amen and the future will be bright orange for all of us, for Amen. everyone from here on out. Amen to that. Um, and the first chapter talks about uh, a girl named uh, Royal Roya Maboub from Afghanistan. And she was head of the women's or the girls robotics team in Afghanistan, which was a, uh, basically very difficult because uh, at the time, you know, it, it wasn't looked it wasn't looked upon as a nice thing for girls to be doing technical and intellectual things. And on top of that, women are not allowed to hold bank accounts. So for any type of funding for this project of hers, uh, she basically wasn't allowed to transact without the permission of a man. Um, and so what she started doing is she started using Bitcoin. Um, she basically subverted all of the, the, um, rules and regulations around women not being able to do their own finances. And she started paying the girls from the robotics team with Bitcoin. And it was just one of those moments where you, you realize that Bitcoin is actually indeed helping people around the globe. Um, and unfortunately for, for Roya, when she was there, well, the, you know, people caught wind of what she was doing and they, they tried to kill her. They tried to kill her and she had to escape Afghanistan. But in doing so, she was able to leave Afghanistan with her assets as well, <laughs> with Bitcoin. I do buy into the idea of hyper-Bitcoinization over a long period of time, and I'm so freaking bearish on fiat currency. They are programmed to fail. Like, they, they will continue to debase. As that happens, more and more people will choose the better money, and more people will... will be forced to choose the money because it'll get so bad in terms of the loss of purchasing power. Merchants like eventually will say, no, I don't accept fiat. Like I choose, like pay me a Bitcoin, right? And I think we will get there. I just think it, it takes a lot of time. How that plays out like, is anyone's guess. Uh, but I think, I do think the fiat currencies are, are, are going to zero, man.
don't know how many times we have to explain Cause every day Maxis tell you get your coins off the exchange It was Terra, it was Luna, it was Celsius and FTX If it's not your keys, it's not your coin, so you're bound to get wrecked If you wanna store your hard on coin, then here's some advice Take your coins off the exchange and put it all on ice And if you can't, well then have fun staying poor Cause we told you once or twice and we can't tell you much more That it's not your keys Gamma Sam B told a crypto story. Fucked around and found out. Now here come Cor. Trying to get yield from the crypto Ponzi. Bunch of VC clowns is all that I see. Blaming toxic Maxis tried to warn ya. Found out not your keys, not your Bitcoin ya. I'ma take my seed, you take your paper. When all your wealth is gone, see me later. You know that it's not your keys, not your coin, not your keys, not your coin, not your coin, not your keys, not your coin, not your keys, not your coin. SBF, got your Bitcoin keys, that coin getting freeze. Trust me when I say that's the goal that we hate to see. Ask yourself how long it gonna take for those keys get seized. Don't you know the whole point? There's no third party bringing the rug Getting greedy, sicky, you're like a drug You find a plug, they lure you in and give it a tug Like Icarus, flew too close to the sun Our advice? What's our advice? Loot to the asset you know you can trust Verifiably You know that it's not your keys Not your coin, not your keys Not your coin, not your coin, not your keys Not your coin, not your keys, not your coin Not your keys honor of the cyber hornets today this is literally the incorruptible substance that will transform humanity you'll see price explosions that i think people can't possibly imagine and i think we'll see this the entire decade this could be the greatest night of our lives i have anxiety going to bed at night if i'm short bitcoin is rational optimism you're putting aside something for future you you're saying i have a future i love myself will you fight no we will run it actually changes you fundamentally as a person and it opens you to the possibility that that truth not authority is the final source of legitimacy if you can fix the money you can fix the world this is one of the most resilient systems on earth uh, perhaps the most resilient system on earth it, you cannot kill it day may come when the courage of man fails but it is not this day the is the yeah. This far, no far. We are either all wrong, or it is the best asymmetric bet of our lifetime. Um, and, and I don't think we're wrong. Failure is not an option. That's how winning is done. Believe me when I say we can break this army here. You need to know that your energy is not going to be stolen from you so that you can plan for the entirety of, of your life. And that's why we need sound money, and that's why we need... Bitcoin. It's gonna work harder than you ever worked before. One inch at a time. And they will know what we can do! This is the best risk-reward trade in history, um, especially if you think about risk-reward trades that are uh, available to the general public, to everybody globally. Um, so yeah, I mean, that's, that's how I see it. I view the network effect as having achieved kind of escape velocity, uh, where the probability of, of permanent you know, loss to any other attempt really was low. I can send value to anyone on earth without anyone else's permission. And that's that's never been possible before. Let no man forget how menacing we are. We are lions. You're like a big bear, man. This is your time. Seize the day. Never surrender. And if you think you can put this genie back in the bottle at this point, and you're just totally kidding yourself. I mean, I, I think it's impossible to stop. Bitcoin is not going away. So I, I view Bitcoin as the best chance we have. Steel is concentrated energy in metallic form. You ever walk in a, a steel plant and yeah. you look at the energy going into steel refining? Yeah. It's concentrated energy. The history of the human race is the civilization that channels energy most effectively always wins. Steel trumps Iron. Iron trumps bronze. Bronze trumps rocks. Bows and arrows trump the guy with the spear. The guy with the spear beats the guy with the knife. It's always a matter. If you have air power, you beat land power. Sea power beats the, beats the army. And nuclear power trumps everybody.
And, uh, and so if I have steel, I have concentrated metallic energy, I can create a skyscraper punched up 100 stories in New York. How long will it last? 100 years. How long will a steel ship last? Longer than you will last, as long as it doesn't corrode. Wooden ships? Not so much. Wooden ships rot, right? You want to build a, a building to, and punch it up against gravity and hold it 100 years, you need concentrated energy. If you want to build a trust fund that'll last 100 years. How do you save $100,000 for 100 years and give it to your great grandkids? You put it in the US dollar, you use 99% of your economic energy. You put it in gold, gold supply doubles every 30 years. The gold bankers keep inflating the gold. Maybe you lose 90% of your economic energy. But that would be a lucky happenstance because just about every country on earth sees the gold from their citizens the last 100 years. Everybody, even the US, they take your gold. Yeah. So you want to save money for 100 years. You can't do it with the currency. You can't do it with gold. Which company is going to be around 100 years? You want to put $100,000 into real estate in Florida? Can you buy $100,000? Let's say you could. 2% tax, 4% maintenance fee, 4% of $100,000, $4,000 a year. Your money's not going to last 100 years. How do I preserve my property, which is economic energy, which is capital, which is money? How do I preserve that? I need something harder, more durable. I need a steel. I need an economic steel. Steel is concentrated metallic energy. Bitcoin is concentrated digital energy. It's energy in digital form. I eliminated the friction on energy. What's the half-life of... Uh, a common piece of FUD against Bitcoin is that it has a negative environmental impact. But it's important to remember that it is designed to consume the cheapest energy in the world. Like your incentive as a mining operator is to seek out the cheapest energy, wasted energy, surplus energy production and convert that to digital gold because that's how you remain competitive in the marketplace. So I actually think that Instead of boiling the oceans, like Bitcoin could be something that saves them. Um, we've never had a system that incentivized the planet to to do this, to actually be more energy efficient. You know, governments are the opposite. They, they induce inefficiency. That's what bureaucracy is, right? Um, I think it was Friedman said there's nothing more permanent than a temporary government solution. Like there's uh, the, the funny example there is I think it was in Lebanon. They still have the railroad authority, right? And there hasn't been a track of railroad in Lebanon for 30 years or something like Governments are the institution of inefficiency in the world. And by removing this parasite from the productive organism that is the world economy, we actually get back to um, a place that's much more environmentally friendly. And the studies bear this out. Um, the UN conducted a lot of studies saying that when people's per capita GDP gets above, say, $5,000, um, they actually become more environmentally conscious because to be conscious of your environment and concern for it is actually a luxury. Like you have to meet your basic needs first before you can go out and, and start cleaning up the ocean, for instance. And so in the Bitcoin accelerates trade, innovation and wealth creation, I think it will cultivate more environmental consciousness, consciousness worldwide. Also, the ethical responsibility of us as people in charge of these exchanges to just be good people, like do not be putting 67,000 tokens in people's faces. Do not go down the casino road. And why I love this place is because everyone here understands that no matter what value these other currencies, cryptocurrencies might offer, it is in the best interest of humanity that as much momentum and energy be behind one single clearing layer as possible, and that is Bitcoin. Which one's the best crypto asset? Well, Bitcoin's the best crypto asset. Okay. What's the second best? There is no second best. There is no second best crypto asset. There's a crypto asset. It's called Bitcoin, right? Right? There is no second best, okay? But take all your money, buy Bitcoin. Then take all your time, figure out how to borrow more money to buy more Bitcoin. Then take all your time and figure out what you can sell to buy Bitcoin. And if you absolutely love the thing that, you're, that you don't want to sell it, Go mortgage your house and buy Bitcoin with it. And if you've got a business that you love because your family works for the business that's in your family for 37 years and you can't bear to sell it, mortgage it, finance it, and convert the proceeds into the hardest money on earth, which is Bitcoin. Bitcoin.